voltage regulators, probably one of the most important components in your electronic design and today I wanted to discuss a common question that I get asked on my channel and that is what size capacitor should I use on my voltage regulator? Now the answer is quite different for a switching regulator so we'll probably cover that a different day but today we're going to discuss linear regulators and there's a common misconception that if you just use some of the largest capacitors you can and just bank them up on the output then you have a nice smooth voltage rail and you won't have any trouble. And in fact the reality couldn't be further from that misconception and today we're going to discuss why. Now to start off with I will point out that some linear regulators have very specific requirements on the input and output capacitors because they use different pass elements and in particular LDO regulators are known for this uh, because they tend to use PNP type pass elements they have very different loop gain and you do need uh, specific ceramic capacitors for example on the output to keep it stable across its operation. Today we're going to just discuss the LM7005 type regulator with its NPN pass transistor so that we can focus more on the wider picture and the control loop that's going on inside this device. Now if we have a look at what we've got in the LM7805, first of all we've got our positive supply rail here, so we've got our input, we've got ground all the way down here, and this is our output. And basically we have our op-amp and some compensation in here, and then this is actually our pass element. So through this NPN transistor and to the output voltage, and then we have a feedback node here with our classic sort of op-amp type design here, differential amplifier that's then adjusting the pass transistor to adjust the output voltage. Now in an ideal world what we'd have is our input voltage here with no series impedance, so basically unlimited current here, and in this case we wouldn't actually need any output capacitor because this can source all of the current that we need, and then we've got our NPN transistor sized accordingly, uh, in this case on a 7805 we can provide one amp through that pass transistor and so long as our output doesn't exceed that one amp our pass transistor will always be able to provide the current needed and therefore we shouldn't really see any transients in there depending on the load that is presented on the output. Now obviously in reality our supply source always has some parasitics in particular it has some resistance and also some inductance to the VIN pin and therefore whenever we draw a transient we will see a little dip in the voltage at this point. So we tend to have quite a reasonable capacitance here, maybe of a few different types, so electrolytic combined with a ceramic so that we can fill in those gaps. But then in this case where we have an emitter follower, this has a voltage gain of almost unity, it has very wide band operation, and critically it has no low frequency poles in the control loop. So basically compensation is very simple, just by putting these capacitors in the control loop and we end up with a situation where we just have a roll off of minus 20 dB per decade in this control loop. And that is why devices with the NPN pass transistor don't actually need any output capacitance on the, here for the device to remain stable. However, there are lots of parasitics all over, lots of impedances, lots of inductance, that kind of thing, and therefore we do need some capacitance on here if we've got any kind of electronics on here that's doing switching, so logic gates or a microcontroller, that's drawing transients all the time, and we want our output voltage to remain as stable as possible. And so that is why you'll often see this typical diagram used on your linear voltage regulator. So you have an input capacitor, an output capacitor, and that's it. And it specifically says for those with NPN pass transistors, although no output capacitor is needed, it does help with the transient response. And it's talking here about really quite a small capacitance here to keep that transient response under control. When you look at some of the designs, particularly on the Hi-Fi forums, uh, I mean, look at this. We've got a discrete voltage regulator. So they've got some NPN transistors here that are being used to control the voltage output from this regulator. So we've got some in input capacitors and some diodes. That's absolutely fine. You want lots of input capacitance from your toroidal transformer. But then they put this huge capacitor bank on the output here, which means that these transistors have got loads of work to do to try and steer the voltage when you've got all of this capacitance on here. And it's a little bit clearer when you think about what's actually going on inside the regulator. So what we have inside our regulator is essentially this. So we've got our NPN, it's actually a Darlington uh, transistor pair. Then we have our output voltage, and then we're getting feedback from V out to feed into our error amplifier, 
and then that is driving that Darlington driver. And if we have loads of capacitance on here, all we're doing is slowing down the feedback loop. And even worse, what we're doing is, although we're slowing down the feedback loop, now when we've got loads of capacitance on the output, we have to drive loads of current through these pass transistors in order to restore the transient voltage that was taken from those capacitors. So actually the regulator ends up doing a lot more work. So I'm hoping here that we're going to be able to demonstrate some of the effects. However, there are quite a lot of factors in play. First of all, we've got this on a breadboard, so that already adds some non-idealities. Then when we try different capacitors, obviously they all have different ESR and that kind of thing. So they're all going to behave a little bit different. But I'm hoping we're going to be able to show something here. So what we've got here is 10 volts coming in to an LM7805. And then we've got the scope probes connected directly to that regulator. And just for reference, I did test this with the short probe. Uh, it's quite difficult to do on a breadboard, but the waveforms are looking pretty much exactly the same. So I'm not too concerned about using the ground probe and having that loop there. It doesn't seem to be affecting the readings enough. Then what we've got here is about 800 milliamps of load through these resistors connected to a Darlington driver. And then the inputs to the driver are connected to a signal generator. And that's just giving us a 250 microsecond pulse. So these aren't barely dissipating any power. It's a very short pulse just to try and show the transients. Now I did just want to mention that to drive this with the signal generator, I'm actually using this tiny little one that came through the post recently. Actually really quite a nice device. I do like the form factor, although when I uh, requested it I thought it was going to be quite a bit bigger. But actually it's quite nice and seems to work really well actually. Um, it's quite convenient, so it's powered by 5 volts 2 amps. It came with a USB to DC barrel jack connector and it also came with a USB um, AC adapter. I'm not sure if you can power it directly from the USB port or whether that's just for the interfacing with the software. It's got a little power button and then on the other side channel 1 and 2 and the sync input as well. But it seems to work really nice and one of the features that I do like about this one is it seems to remember the settings uh, when you power it back up. So with some of the other signal generators that I've used previously, when you turn it off you lose all of the settings and when you turn it back on you have to reset everything. So often that's a bit of a faff when you've set up quite a few parameters. With this one it just seems to remember it and when you power it back up you can just turn the power back on and away you go. So I do quite like this one. Um, it has the option for high impedance or 50 ohm output so it seems to work quite nicely. So I'll put links in the description if you are interested in taking a look at this unit. So to start off with as a baseline I thought we'd have a look at what the waveform looks like with no capacitance whatsoever in the circuit. Now I have ad added in another channel to the scope into the input of the regulator so we can see what both the input and the output looks like on that regulator. Now my peaker scope is actually broken on one channel so I've had to add this series capacitance to AC couple it into there so the waveform might not be perfect on that channel. And another thing to bear in mind is we do have some reasonably long leads to the power supply. So these are about 50 centimetres in length. So that is going to add some inductance to the design. Let's have a look at the waveform. And here what we can see is the input is in blue and the output is in red. And we're getting a little bit of ringing here. That's as a result of those power supply leads with no capacitance. So that inductance causes the ripple when that load is applied. You can also see that inductance has quite an effect. It takes quite a long time before the voltage settles after the load is removed. So what we've got here is a 220 microfarad 35 volt Panasonic FM capacitor. Really quite a nice capacitor, very low ESR. So this should be a good one for this test. And what we're going to do is plug that in to the input to the regulator. So I'm applying it now. And that has cleaned up the waveform quite considerably. So remember the output is in red and we do see that horrible transient. That is basically where the load is applied and the control loop is trying to react. But we do have those compensation capacitors in there. So it takes a bit of time for it to adjust. So we see the voltage drop and then quickly recover. Then when the load is removed, we then see a big spike because now the control loop's got to wind back the voltage to take it back down to 5 volts. So... These are the tra transients that we're actually trying to get rid of. We're not trying to recover this period here, which is actually just resistive losses between the power supply and the load. So really what we want our capacitor to do is replenish that very small amount of energy before the control loop has chance to do anything. 
Now let's take a look at what happens if we actually don't have any input capacitance, but we move that capacitor to the output. So I'm disconnecting it and then putting it on the output instead. So now what we can see is quite a different waveform. Let me pause the waveform because it's moving around a little bit. But basically, here's the point where our load is applied. Then it undershoots by about 75 millivolts and then starts to climb back up to the point where we've just got those resistive losses and then it recovers once the um, load is removed. Now what we can see in contrast that's quite different is that there's quite a period of time before we start to be able to draw any current at the input. So previously, as soon as the load was applied, there was that brief transient and then bam, it started to respond. Now we've got this much longer response. You can see the voltage at the input to the regulator here because we've got all of that capacitance on the output and none on the input. So at this point here, we've got both the load, 800 milliamps applied, but we've also got to supply the energy to the capacitor as well to try and bring that voltage back up. So now what I'm going to do is put an identical capacitor on the input and the output. So we've got a pair of these 220 microfarad capacitors. Let's see what the waveform looks like now. So what we're seeing now is a slightly cleaner waveform, but we still do have that delay before the regulator is able to bring the output voltage back up to where it wants to be because of all that additional output capacitance. Now let's remove the 220 microfarad capacitor from the output and put something much larger in, so a 1500 microfarad capacitor. So now with that much larger capacitance, first of all you can see we're starting to see a much bigger transient again at the beginning of the waveform and that's because we're starting to see some of the effects of the different ESR on that electrolytic capacitor. It tends to have a poorer high frequency response so that's starting to reappear again. Secondly what we're seeing is it takes quite a long time once the load is removed for the voltage to recover. So this is the point where the load's removed and then it's taking all this time here before it recovers back to 5 volts. The other thing that can be noticed is from where the load is applied we've got all of this time now. It's increased by probably about twice the amount of time before the regulator is starting to actually be able to do something. So at this point we're using the storage in the capacitor and then the regulator is trying to work hard at this point to try and provide power to the load and the capacitor. Now one I think I might need to simulate to try and understand what's going on here, but if we use something that's far too small, it seems to give us some ringing on the waveform. So first of all we've got this 0.47 microfarad capacitor, and if we add that in to the output of the regulator, you can see that gives us a pretty terrible looking output waveform with some ringing there. Similar story if we use a ceramic capacitor. So if we put that in here, again you can see some quite considerable ringing. So I think we've got some LC tank circuit type thing going on, which is something that I did a video on a couple of years ago. Uh, that's my only explanation for this. So we're getting some resonance between the extremely low ESR of these capacitors and some of the inductances that we're getting on this breadboard. And so with just a 2.2 microfarad capacitor on the output there, that seems to be giving us quite a clean waveform. We've got a little bit of undershoot here, but then it recovers quite quickly. And also the recovery to the output voltage once the load is removed, that is also giving us quite a quick response time. So I think that's quite interesting. That shows that even with quite a large load, this is an 800 milliamp load, all you need is this tiny 2.2 microfarad capacitor on the output of your linear regulator. And many people would be tempted just to put a couple of thousand microfarads on there because it feels like what you should do. But in fact, that doesn't actually have any benefit. And sometimes it can be of detriment. Uh, there are situations where that large response time actually results in parts of your circuit browning out where you've had way too much capacitance. And removing some of that is actually the solution to the problem. Now there are obviously some circumstances where you might want a large amount of output capacitance. So for example, in a situation where your output is intermittent, so I'm thinking of things like a solenoid that might fire every so often, in that instance you're possibly likely to exceed the rating of your regulator and your original power supply. So in that case you might want to have a capacitor bank specifically for that purpose, but what you'd want to do in that situation is try and isolate 
the capacitor bank from the regulator itself, especially if you've got other things hanging off there. So you might want to think about having a CLC or a CLC LC filter with those inductors basically isolating each capacitor section and giving you quite a high rejection ratio between the input and the output. But I think just generally speaking, for your standard general purpose electronics where you're keeping well within the capabilities of your regulator and your power supply, what you want to focus on is making sure that you've got a good DC into your linear regulator and then you don't need much capacitance on the output whatsoever. Now in terms of switching regulators the story is very different and I think I have touched on it in a few videos. Uh, I did a video on designing a switch mode power supply for the signal generator. I'll put a link to that up here but if there is a call for it then I can go through that in a bit more detail just about the capacitor sizing for those regulators. So let me know your thoughts and comments down below. Hopefully this has helped someone and also trying to stop that bad practice of just putting a whole bank of capacitors on the output of your linear regulator. In most cases it's just really not needed. So I hope you've enjoyed the video. Thank you to JLC PCB for sponsoring the video. Also a big thank you to my Patreon supporters. I don't often thank them enough uh, but you really help keep the channel going so a big thank you to you as well. So hope you've enjoyed the video. Until next time, thanks for watching.